especially code that you didn't write or code that you wrote more than three months ago. You, three months ago, didn't know what she was doing. We've all been there, right? Texts is test driven. Well, it does two things for you. First, well, it does a lot of things for you, but it does two things relevant to this conversation. First, it says you'd like to test as you go, just a little bit ahead of your production code, sort of in parallel. Uh, you are making sure that your text, uh, test that you write after software has been written, may not be possible because the design doesn't support it, and it's also just uh, it takes a lot of self-discipline, and in my experience, people are just, once the software is done, they don't want to go back and test around it, they just want to go back. So, successful software minimizes the time required to create, modify, and maintain the software. You're, that really means, well, you've got to focus on the modification and maintenance, because that's mm -hmm. where all your cost is. To do that, you have to be able to change your software without breaking it. To do that, you need to test that, you need to test for themselves. So the secret, to successful software is test driven development. And that is what I want to talk about this conference. And the way that's how you know your company from Dr. Heller. Because most companies, most software gets worse and worse and worse over time. It's fun the first six months, and then not so much fun after a year. Sort of painful after three years. And after seven years, everybody on the team saying, This is a piece of crap, it's time to rewrite. And seven years is just too short. It's not, it's, it's too short of a time mm -hmm. to rewrite the software. And that is one of the reasons why some companies for uh, Now, JavaScript, this is, this is not just about JavaScript, this is true of any software, any language. Uh, JavaScript does bring some of, its own, some of its own challenges. If you haven't seen this talk, what? Who is it? Um, Destroy All Software, what's his name? Gary Bernhardt. It's brilliant. It's hilarious. Uh, and it highlights some of the funny things about JavaScript. But JavaScript does have a lot of gotchas. You've got to remember to use the right number of equal signs. Uh, not just one, not just two, but three. And you've got to remember to keep your semicolons in there or keep them out if you don't like them. And you've got to remember uh, all these other little details over this. Um, so that's a problem. We've got browsers. I love this picture. And uh, yeah, well, Opera's being lifted up by, by Safari. <laughs> and I guess we need to link on there now too, don't we? And, um, and another problem that people don't necessarily think of as a JavaScript problem is that most of the code you write in JavaScript is UI code. And UI code, in my experience, is, is one of the most fun types of code to write, but it's also one of the hardest type, types of code to do test-driven development. <laughs> and this is XKCD. So, uh, in tonight's talk, I'm going to talk about the solutions or some solutions to these three problems, uh, specifically using test driven development when these problems are present in JavaScript. So, first problem is language gotchas. The solution for that, or a solution for that, is automatic static code analysis or linting. Yes, linting. How many of you? Actually, I should have done this in the beginning. How many of you are using Lint now? JS Hint or JS Lint? Awesome. How many of you would be in deep trouble if you weren't using JS Hint or JS Lint now? I'm, I'm right there. I have had so many bugs caught by this tool. JS Lint or JS Hint, um, it analyzes your code and just finds some really common mistakes. It will tell you when you're using two equal signs instead of three. It will tell you when you've left out a semicolon. It will tell you when you're using this incorrectly. It, uh, it catches a lot of the really common mistakes. Now, it's not just about using JS Hint or JS Lint. I also think that something really important to have in this environment is an automated build. Because you want to be running JS Hint every time you make a change, which, and every time you test your code. And for me, that's you know about every 30 seconds. You also want to be able to run JSLint whenever you whenever you integrate your code. If you're doing continuous integration, 
you want to run lint and all your other checks every time you lint, or every time you check in your code, or every time you integrate with the rest of the team. So that's where an automated build comes in as well. So this talk isn't just talking. I'm gonna, I would like to actually show you some code for this. Now, you can find this code on my, uh, on my GitHub site, which is James Shore, and you can find it under LL10. Uh, I'll, I forgot to put the link in my slide, but I'll, get, I'll put it in at the end of the talk. So let's, uh, let's actually see this go. So what I want to show you here is just an <coughs> automated build. I'm not sure if this will work. My, my preferred tool for automated builds is Jake. How many of you are doing automated builds now? Oh, good. OK, so this is, this is going to be new for most of you. An automated build gives you a lot of power and flexibility. Uh, how many of you are using Node? Node is just a way of running JavaScript on the command line. It's, it also comes with a built-in library for doing servers, so it's got a lot of, a lot of uh, kudos for that. But you can install Node just to use it for a command line tool. I, which is what I do. So I'm going to install Jake using the npm install tool. Hopefully that will work. There we go. And I'm going to run it. It's going to be in node modules slash bin slash Jake. Here we go. And I'm going to make myself a little shell script to run Jake. jakefile.js. And whatever's in there will run. But it provides a couple of functions just off the bat. One is desk for description. So here's a task. And the other is, if I remember, task. And what happens here is you pass that task a callback, a function, and whatever's inside that task will run whenever you tell Jake to run that task on the command line. So if I've done this right, I type Jake example, it should say hi. And it does. Does everybody see that okay? Can you pull it up a little bit? Yeah, just pull it up a little bit. How's that? Good. So now what we have is just a simple way of running things from the command line. Jake also gives you the ability to see what all your targets are. Everything that has a description will have that description laid out on the command line like this. It will also run whatever you type in the default task, well, by default. So you don't need to, you don't need to actually type in the task name every time. So we can say, this is the default task. So now if I just run Jake, it should say, nope. Yes, this is why I need test driven development. And then everything else. Because I can't type for more than 30 seconds without making a mistake. Pairing is really good too, but these days I don't have a lot of people here. So there, I type Jake, and it says this is the default task. We type dash T, we'll see that doesn't show up. Uh, if it wanted to show up, we could say description. Uh, by default, say something. And that will now show up here. So pretty simple, straightforward, valuable just for that. The other thing, though, that a, an automated build tool like Jake or Rake or Make or in, any of the many other tools in that ecosystem will give you is they will also give you the ability to run dependencies. 
So what I can do is I can say that example is a dependency of default. And now when I run default, it will run the dependency first. So it will say hi, and then it will say this is the default task. And I'm not going to demonstrate it, but it will only run each dependency once. So it, uh, and you can see how this would be useful for a build. Let's say you've got a test, a test task, and you have a lint task, and you have some other sort of minify task, and you want the, uh, the lint and the test to depend on your code minifying first. You can say both, that both of them depend on minify, and will only run your minification step once, which is convenient. So this is sort of the most basic, bare bones level of rigorous professional jobs here. Remember, look, we're, we're reducing our costs, making it easier to maintain and develop the code. We're taking a little bit more time setting up some automation. And then once this is done, it just keeps working, and we can keep improving it and, and increasing the level of automation for the rest of the project. Now. When somebody new comes onto the team, you don't say, well, here's how you build the code. First, print out this long list of steps, and then you go to the JS site and paste in all your code, and then you do this, and then you do that, and then you do this, and then you do that, and then hopefully you just get everything works you deploy. No, you just say, check out the code from the repository, type J, and it will run. If you've done it right, it will say OK, and if you've done it wrong, it will tell you what to do. So that's Jake. Now that we have an automated build, what we can do is we can bring in JS Hint, which is the, the uh, automated static analysis tool. I'm not going to go through that detail. I'm just going to pull it in. I thought I was going to pull it in. Why does it say I'm pulling it? Let's install it. Uh, JS Hint is, uh, is something else that you can install through Node uh, through, through NPM. NPM is the, the Node.js package manager. I have, I have built a little uh, convenience tool to, to run it, and that's what you see here. Now let's see if this actually works. That's fine. What did you say? It's no, it's it's it's, 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 in, it's in the repository. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what about the front? Yes. 
I have not used Grunt personally, and that's because uh, it's not a style of tool I care for. But they are in the same class. They're both trying to solve the same problem. But they're doing it in different ways. Jake and Rake and Ant, well not Ant, Jake and Rake and Mae are all kind of doing the same thing, which is allowing you to run just regular code. Uh, Jake is nothing more than a thin wrapper over JavaScript. Your JavaScript can be anything you want. Grunt and Maven and Ant and tools like that try to do more for you at the cost of not allowing you to run arbitrary code. You can write your own modules. It's more DSL oriented. Now you can write your own modules, but my experience is that the more somebody tries to do for me, it's sort of like if I'm out at a bus station and somebody says they're going to do me a favor. No. <laughs> I want to have control. I'm a bit of a control freak. So if I can write JavaScript, I'm good. If somebody else is going to make my life easier, that means that as soon as there's something I need that they don't do for me, my life is now twice as difficult. So that's why I don't tend to use tools like Grunt or Maven, because uh, they make the easy things easy, and they but the hard things much harder. So Now, that said, if you want to use Grunt, more power to you. Any sort of build automation. My experience is that I run into walls less frequently using Jake, but I do spend a little bit more time in the beginning setting up the basics that are in, come with them. Any other questions about the robot? <coughs> Feel free to stop me and ask questions as we go. I don't. I wasn't planning on stopping at the end of the questions. We'll just take questions. Uh, now, what you have build automation, you can do is continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, continuous integration is really nothing more than making sure that everybody on the team has merged all their code together every couple of hours. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to, uh, to have an automated build. Uh, so that when somebody, when you check in your code, you get everybody else's code, you check it in, you run the automated build on the whole shebang, <coughs> off and on a, third, uh, on a separate machine, and make sure it works. You can use a CI server to do that, or you can do it by hand, either way, an automated bill, it makes that easy and repeatable. Okay. So the next problem, cross-browser incompatibility. How many of you have run into this? How many of you don't want to raise your hands? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, this, of course, is the main, this is the DOM and cross-browser incompatibility is why I really complain about JavaScript. JavaScript is a really cool language. A lot of people have a lot of problems with JavaScript that actually are really a problem with the DOM and the way JavaScript is a So the solution to this, there's many solutions, but my preferred solution is cross-browser test driven development. There's multiple tools that will do this for you. One is JS Test Driver. Another is uh, called Testum, or Testum Scripts. But my current favorite is a tool called Karma, which when I made this slide, was called Testacular. And you can see why they changed the name. <laughs> yeah. It's called Karma, uh, K-A-R-M-A. So let me show that to you. I've done this right. So the way Testacular works, or Karma, sorry, I've been calling it Testacular for so long. Uh, the way Karma works is you run a Karma server, which I've just done as part of my build script, and then you take your browser and you capture it by going to localhost 88. Here we go. And once you've done that, you can run your tests, and then Karma will take your tests and it'll ship them over to the server it's running. And the browser will detect that it, the files have been put up on the server, it'll download them and run your tests. 
So you can do command line testing very fast. See how fast that runs? And have it work just like a regular command line test, but it's actually running in the browser. Let me show you this test code. No, it does not. In fact, I've connected my iPad to the test version. And it will run your test. You can, I haven't done an Android, I don't own an Android, but you could hypothetically do an Android device or an iPhone, or you could set up a server and have that serve, you know, be your, your server. Let me show you what the test looks like. How many of you are familiar with Mocha? Mocha is a test driven development tool. And uh, this is this is Mocha and expect JS for assertion. So what we have here is just a very, very simple test in Mocha saying that we expect true to be true. And we can change that, say expect true to be false, and run our tests again. And what we see is it say our test failed. Change okay, it back. The neat thing about this, the, the really important thing about this, is that it gives us the same power and speed of doing test driven development in any language, except we have our test running in a browser. And that's not all. Not only can we run the tests on Firefox, we can also simultaneously run our tests on Safari. Now we've got two browsers connected. There we go. Hey, true is equal to true on both of those browsers. Awesome. Sometimes you just can't trust it, right? Not only that, we can run it on Chrome. Let's see, does our software work on Chrome? Yes, yes it does. All right. Uh, of course, we want to know if it works on a mobile device, so we'll bring up the iOS simulator. Pull that up. And now we know that our tests work on Firefox, Safari, Chrome, and Safari on iOS. The real problem, of course, is IE. So let's pull up. I, I don't know if I'm brave enough to do A. Let's do IE9 in a, in a virtual machine. Uh, this is a virtual machine. So I'm going to point it not at localhost because that would be the virtual machine, but actually the machine it's running on, which is jamesshore.local. Please do not point your browser at jamesshore.local. Now it's running on IE9. See, yes, it works on IE9 as well. And just for you, we'll run it on IE8 as well. <coughs> And do the same thing. Jake Shore about local eighty eighty eight. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. I don't know why. It probably just still spinning up the VM. Let's try that again. This is. Uh, there we go. So, does true equals true on IE8? Well, some days yes, some days no. Today, yes, it does. So there we go. That's the second thing that I do in order to get really rigorous professional JavaScript uh, is I do all my tests using Karma and run. Whenever I do the front end development, I run them against these uh, six browsers. I could also bring in IE7, but I don't want to anymore. And uh, I could also bring Android and IE10. Uh, I haven't actually tried that yet, but I have no reason to do it. The reason I haven't done Android yet is because I haven't figured out the Android simulator for a number of devices. But you could do those as well. Yes, it does. Yeah, what happens is, here, let me, so the question was, do you have access to DOM? So what happens is, Karma, I don't know if you can see this very well. Karma embeds an iframe, and that iframe is loaded dynamically for your test code and everything else every time. 
So right now it's empty, but that's where that's where it would go. If we were to set a break point, uh, we would see the code there, but I'm not going to do that. It's still there. So we can just tuck these away, and it will just keep on running. Oh, there's something else. Uh, in the source code, which I will give you uh, for this, I've also set up my build script to do something pretty cool, which is require all these browsers, so that if I'm not running one of these browsers, uh, the test will fail. So if I come along and I say, we're not going to run Chrome. If I forget to run Chrome, my build script will fail and tell me that Chrome wasn't tested. If I'm feeling lazy, I've also set it up so you can do a, a command line parameter, loops equals true. It'll tell you that it wasn't tested, but it won't fail to build it. This, by the way, is the kind of thing that I find really easy to do in something like Jake that I wouldn't know how to do in Chrome. Because, you know, it's just an if now. Okay, let's bring Chrome back in. Any questions about this stuff before I move on to the next thing? All right, next problem, lots of UI code. So I've demonstrated a really simple test. Uh, the problem is, uh, I don't remember who asked about the DOM, but the problem is once you start getting into the DOM and events and everything else, things get a little bit trickier. The solution to that is, well, using one of several UI test patterns. And that's what I want to spend uh, the rest of our available time on. This go, we're going until 8.30, right? Randall stepped down. Good, we're, we should be doing some fine. So let's go back to this simple code. What I want to do is actually test drive this code. I want to, using our, our Karma our build tool and our Jake build tool, I want to build this form from scratch using test-driven development. And because this is a presentation, we don't have a lot of time, it's going to be really simple. Again, what, you, what we want to have happen here is when the submit button is clicked, if the field is empty, it turns pink. And the field is not empty, it follows the link. Now, a quick reminder, I'm sure you're all really familiar with, with DOM, but uh, the this page is represented in memory in the browser with a bunch of elements that are arranged in a tree structure. This is DOM. And the way events work is we can register an event on any of these elements. And of course, the one we want to register the event on is the submit link. When that submit link is clicked, we want to do something. The way we do that is with that add event listener. Now, normally you're going to be using jQuery. We all love jQuery, right? But for this presentation, I want to get right down into the, into the bare metal. So we add a listener for the type of event we care about and pass in a callback. And that function, that, not, that callback, will be registered on that element. What happens now is when that submit button is clicked, an event is created, and it is passed down through the entire DOM in multiple phases. First, there's a capture phase. When you add the event, you can say which phase you want it to run. First thing you have is a capture phase. The event is run on all of the event listeners that are supposed to run in the capture phase for the window, and then for the document, HTML body, and it goes all the way down. And then it gets to the actual link event element that was clicked. That's called the target phase. It runs all the event handlers on that element for the target phase, <coughs> including ours. And then it goes in the bubble phase, which is what you'll get by default in tools like jQuery, and goes all the way back up. And then finally, it runs the browser's default action. The browser default action is to follow the link. You can cancel the, you can stop the event handler, the event from going through the DOM by running stop propagation, except on ID8. And you can, uh, on that, it's event.return value equals true, if I remember correctly. And you can um, prevent the default by calling event.event default. That one's relevant to us because what we want to do is stop the link from being followed. That's the default action. 
So what we're going to want to do is register an event handler on the click, on the submit click, that prevents the default under certain circumstances. Okay. I think it, well, most of you have seen this before. Right? Okay. There's three, there's lots of different ways of testing UIs, but there's three that I found sort of the, the big three. You can use a robot, you can simulate the events, or you can bypass, you can bypass the UI entirely. So we're going to go through each of those in turn, and then we'll demonstrate one of the approaches. Uh, the first approach is to use a robot to control the UI. Have any of you used Selenium WebDriver? <coughs> yeah. Uh, Selenium WebDriver is an example of this strategy. Uh, before, we, before I talk about how that works, though, let me just talk about what happens in general. When, when you click a link in the browser, the OS uh, detects that click, and it tells the browser, somebody clicked your window at this location. The browser takes that and turns it into that click event, and then sends it down to the DOM, uh, as, as we discussed a moment ago. So the way a robot works, Uh, the way a robot works is you write some code to run inside the robot or using the robot. You do something like, say, do a click for me. And the robot turns that into an OS level event. It tells the OS, pretend somebody clicked a window at this location. The OS ships it over to the browser, which turns it back into a click event, and then that goes through the top. So the nice thing about the robot is this is as close as you can get to real user testing without having an army of monkeys in front of, your, in front of your browsers. The disadvantage of it, for those of you who have used Selenium and you've seen this, is really, really slow. It takes four seconds just to run one test, and then, or just to spin things up and run one test. And each test will run half a second to 20 seconds more, depending on what you're doing. <coughs> Second strategy is to simulate the user's events. This is really straightforward. What you do in your test is you just create the click event and you submit it to the browser subsystem. You say, go do. It's my favorite approach. Uh, the disadvantage is you're not actually, it's not a real user behavior, so because you're creating the events. So for example, if you send in a click event, a real user is also going to have a mouse down and a mouse up event, but if you don't send those in, they don't have and then the third strategy is to create a thin, untested layer. You might have heard this, of this as a presentation layer, and just test that directly. Now you're bypassing the UI directly entirely. This is the fastest approach, but it is also um, the least real and the least reliable. So none of these are perfect, but my preference is to simulate the events whenever I can. It's real enough and it's fast enough. It does require you to manually verify that your tests do what you think they are. Because, again, you can say I'm sending the click in, but if the browser doesn't actually do that in response to the user action you're simulating, then it's no good. Uh, for the screencast, what we're doing is we're actually creating a drawing application. So we can drag the mouse around and it will draw on the screen. And I found out that for IE, for everything except IEP8, uh, it would start selecting text in response to the mouse down, which I wanted to prevent and implement default. IE8, on the other hand, would start selecting text in response to the on selected. So even though I was testing for the that I was capturing the mouse down event and preventing default on it, it still didn't work properly on IEP8 because I wasn't testing for the select start or the on, on selected or whatever it was. Um, so, those are the choices. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, JavaScript is, so the question was, it's not always possible to simulate events in other languages. JavaScript is a really wide open language. If you want to simulate an event in the DOM, you just create the event and then you, you post it to the DOM. Uh, not every language allows you to do that. For example, um, I don't know how to do that in Java. It may be possible, but I don't know how to do it. When I've done UI testing in Java, I haven't done that. I've just done the presentation. Okay, 
So any other questions about this before we actually start demonstrating? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's what's the overall strategy? Do everything with two and then prior release, do not do the first one? Um, what I, there, there's of course much more to doing really rigorous development than I can cover in 75 minutes. Uh, so I'm sort of hitting the highlights. What I'll do is I'll do this strategy, simulate the event strategy for all of my unit testing for all of my test driven development work. So as I'm developing the code, I'll be constantly test driving it using this approach. But, and also doing unit testing the stuff that's not UI code. But I also want to have smoke tests. I want to use this strategy of using a real uh, browser like Selenium to make sure that I'm not skipping anything really important. So, but you don't have to use Selenium for that because uh, Selenium is really slow. You can also use Phantom JS, which is a headless web browser. And if you're doing cross-browser test-driven development here and have really thoroughly tested everything, you just need to make sure your HTML is hooked up to your JavaScript properly, and you need to make sure the events do what you think they do manually. And then you can use something like Phantom JS to just make sure everything's hooked together. So that's my current strategy: is use Phantom JS for smoke testing and all, uh, Karma test-driven development for. How, how am I going on speed? Too fast? Too slow? Uh, so, yeah, so the question is, uh, do, do I use Q8? Do I use an army of monkeys? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, well, there's a difference. I don't do it at the end. Uh, if, I have, if I have the luxury of having testers on my team, which I don't always have, but when I have the luxury of having testers on my team, then what I'm, I'm not using them for regression testing. What I'm doing is I'm using them to do exploratory testing and basically help us understand where our blind spots are. So for example, if you're doing this approach, you need to manually check that your events are coming through the way you think they are. Uh, and the programmer should be the one doing that. The tester has got a lot of experience and expertise about what programmers tend to look at. So you use your testers to help you understand what you've forgotten. And then, when you found something, you think of it as, as, as being as significant as a real error getting out to customers. You process analysis on it, you change the process so that kind of issue doesn't come up again. You also change your design to prevent those sorts of bugs from being uh, common, because usually defects are a result of design problems. And, uh, and you know, just be really, really thorough about it. So to answer the question, uh, testers help us identify blind spots. They don't tell us where uh, our software broke uh, the ship broke itself, right? No. Right? Yeah. Also, just uh, throw in a tool out there. Uh, for, for, we, we do test driven uh, the same way you do with number two, but uh, for number one, we use uh, Specflow, and, uh, which is similar to Cucumber. Okay. And so it really helps the brittleness. Uh, okay. Is, uh, is, is that using Phantom JS in the coverage? Or? Uh, we actually uh, use the separate browsers, so our CI runs in the browsers. I see. So it's it's um, how how is it running on the browsers? Um, it connects, so it uses Selenium down. It, it, it does the actual implementation. But the same thing you said with the uh, the testers were really kind of thinking about what we're forgetting and writing the scenarios. I mean that's the best case scenario. You have to be really you have to have a really high quality software development approach in order to be able to get away with that. Uh, and if you don't, then of course you need testers to make sure your application is not broken before you send it out. The problem is, is if you're doing agile development, where you're looking at shipping every time you integrate, so multiple times per day, that's just, you cannot have people manually test your software every time you ship, if you're shipping multiple times per day. Um, so the corollary is, if you want to ship multiple times per day, you need to make your build and test process much more robust. Alright, so let's, let's go ahead and see some examples of this. I mean, 
yes, it worked. <laughs> of course it worked. So here's, here is uh, our HTML. Let me go ahead and pull this up. So this is the code we want to make work. Uh, it's not actually hooked up yet, so if I press, if I leave this empty and press submit, then it gets us, takes us to the destination page. What it's supposed to do is turn the code. So, how do we want to approach this? What's the first thing we should do? I'm sorry? Listen to the click and see if it's been captured. Okay, let's do that. So let's say that the example, um, it does not follow the link when the uh, field is empty. Test driven development, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a rapid cycle of writing a little bit of test code, typically less than five lines, writing a little bit of production code, typically less than five lines, and improving your design through refactoring, and then doing it again. You should be going through this cycle every 30 to 60 seconds when you're not stopping to think. So not counting think, think time, the cycle takes 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, counting think time, of course, can take 10 minutes or on the little lights, depending. So let's just uh, let's just make sure this still works. Okay. So we don't want to follow the link when the field is empty. Now we don't actually have any production code here. So let's write some code just to make sure that the production code exists. And what I think I would like to do. I actually have it set up here already. I want an initialize validation function that's going to take the, L, the DOM element of the text field and the DOM element of the submit form. So let's say I'm going to steal some code. The name speed. So we want it to look like this. Now, we don't have a text field to submit link yet. So let's go ahead and create those as well. The structure of a test or test for development is the YAR admin, if you're a pirate. Uh, a A A R. So you want to see if I can remember what that acronym is. I just like the YAR. It's, um, well basically it's set up your test, it's make an assertion, and uh, it's set up your test, run your production code, make an assertion, and then clean up after your test. That's the R is reset. So what we're doing here is setting up our test code. Then we're gonna execute, that's this part here. And then we're going to assert. Then finally, We'll clean up after ourselves. So, let's see if this works. It shouldn't because we don't have the initialized validation. Yeah. Can't find examples. So let's go ahead and set that up.
that's going to take what? Text fields and submit link. chose this one to jump to right to the hardest one. Usually I start, um, when I did this for real, uh, I started out by making sure that the CSS class was on there to turn it to me. Uh, but we can do this. The way we do this is we want to check to see if um, if the default has been prevented, right? The way we do that is we actually have to capture that click event. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that code over. Create an event cancel variable. We'll listen to the click event, and then we'll see if default prevented or prevented occur, and we'll assign that to event cancel. Does everybody see that logic there? Uh, the event default prevented is something that exists on the DOM, or is is part of the DOM API. So now for our cert, we can say expect event cancel to be true. Anybody see what I did wrong? Anybody? Yogurt. 
Does it depend at all upon the order in which the event handlers are called? It does. Um, so we have add event listener happening before the initialized validation. So that should be happening in the right order. That's a bit of a tricky aspect of this. So if that, if that event listener that you have there is called first, the event cancel would be set to false. We well, might be right. Let's try it that way. Aha. It works. It's alive. Except for IE8. Yes, and that's exactly why we do this. Because IE8 doesn't have event.prevent default. Instead, on IE8, we have event.return value was true. I think. I don't actually know. Uh, because I usually use jQuery, and jQuery abstracts this out nicely. <laughs> <laughs> it does work on jQuery. Uh, and in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is what you would not actually do in your real development, right? I'm going to turn off IE8. <laughs> And I'm going to write again, and what's going to happen is going to say, well, it's going to, Carmen's going to say, what happened to IE8? Let's try that again. It's going to say Windows was not tested, IE8 was not tested. So, just, now this is why an automated build is good. Not only does it protect you against yourself, you can see where everybody on the team is lazy and change the automated build to help them not be so lazy. Remember when I said when a bug occurs, or when a tester finds something that's unexpected, you do root cause analysis and you change your process. This is the kind of thing you do. I added this, make sure all the browsers are running, because I was forgetting to run browsers. And that was good. So, but sometimes you don't want to run all the browsers, uh, for example, now. So I did put in this new SQL true on me. But uh, it's not the default. Have it run correctly. All right, so that would continue on in that vein for a while. And what you would end up with Yeah, I think what happened was that somehow I didn't get Jake checked into my repository and I didn't realize it. All right, well, we're pretty much done anyway. So the, the link I'm going to give you, the one that's actually checked into GitHub, is not the hack together one I did for this presentation. It actually works. And it also has an example of using Steam as well. What I want to show you here, though, is that the other tests work in pretty much the same way. They've been factored out a bit. So you can do all your standard test driven stuff. You can have it before each and after each. So what you tend to do in your DOM tests is you tend to set up your DOM elements in your before each. You tend to take them out in your after each, because otherwise you end up with uh, event handlers running multiple times and so forth. And then each test is going to talk about that specific DOM. So we look at if following the length of the field is not empty, so we expect the event canceled false. It does follow the length of the field, or it does follow the length of the field empty, it does not follow the length of the field. You know what I mean. And it says the CSS class in the field is empty. So when that field is empty and it's clicked, we want to see the class attribute equal required for the class. Now a real production system would also have uh, some code in here to support multiple classes. Uh, we're not going to get into those details now. So to show you the production code, we 
click this link, it should work, but it didn't.
But the, the general direction that you want to go is away from 17th Street until you dead end into the movie theater. And then just go left and it'll be on your right uh, before you kind of um, head out. So without further ado, thank you guys so much for coming out. And uh, definitely you know, give us some feedback online. And also, I do want to mention um, our sponsors, Mark and Glenn, um, are going to be here uh, hanging out, I guess, near, near the goodies. Um, if you do want to uh, catch up with them. So thank you to them as well because they made this all possible.